you you got a you know your your spot in the Elton John band, as it were, um, through Davy, if I'm correct. Is that right? Um, a combination of of um, uh, and Bob Birch, and Bob Birch. Yes, exactly. Um, I've known I knew Bob Birch f f from a long time ago. Like when we we first Bob and I first moved to LA about the same time, um, like 1983 ish, and um, and I had my own original band you know, playing all the nightclubs in LA and Hollywood. And uh, we needed a bass player. And I met Bob, man, I think I met him playing like a wedding reception or something like that, right? So, uh, and he was just the coolest cat and just the greatest musician. I knew right away, you know, we hit it off because he's from Michigan, I'm from Ohio. You know, there's a lot of rivalry there. So, um, uh, yeah, so we hit it off really well. And I asked him to be in the band. And from then on, man, that was, it was like the mid to late eighties. We started playing in my original band called the stick men. And, um, um, you know, as time went on, we both did all kind of different gigs. And then of course, Bob got the Elton gig. And, um, and when the chair opened up, he introduced me to Davey, but well, actually I'll back up a little bit. He, he introduced me to Davey a long time before I actually had an opportunity to be in the band. I think I went to, of course, when he got the, the gig with Elton, I wanted to go see the show. So um, so that's when he introduced me to Davey at one of the shows. Um, this would have been around, I think Bob joined the band around 93 or four, if I'm not mistaken, something like that, the early 90s. So he introduced me to Davey and then uh, Davey was over at Bob's when I was over there. Bob and I used to record a lot in Bob at a studio and we would write tunes and record them. And Davey heard uh, a song that we did that I sang on. And he said to Bob, in case, who's that guy singing? Oh, that's John. You know, you met him at the show a couple, you know, weeks ago, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and next thing I know, Davey calls me up and says, can you come over to Guy Babylon's studio and sing a couple of songs for us that we are working on? And I did that and I, you know, great. Thank you very much. And months went by and next thing I know Davey calls me and says hey you know we're looking for someone like you you know to fill some shoes in the band here that can play percussion that can play drums if you'd have to can do all the electronic stuff can sing of course um and I kind of fit the bill so um I think they auditioned a couple other guys but um but the other guys were mainly singers so, um, and, I, and that's when um, Billy Trudell also joined the band too, the other singer. So when, when you started, was, was he in the band as well, full time, just doing backgrounds? You mean Billy? Yeah. Uh, Billy and I started at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, Billy and I started at the same time and he was just doing backgrounds where I was doing backgrounds and percussion. percussion of course. Yeah. Elton had just come out with, um, uh, the big picture, right? The big picture album. And, uh, and that album had a lot of, there's, if you listen closely, there's some electronic looping and stuff. And I was doing some, you know, the, some of the electronic stuff. And then of course the other small percussion part, I had a much smaller setup back then. Uh, it's, you know, it's grown like this, you know, but um, yeah, yeah. Billy was in there. And then, then Davey and Elton decided to, um, to shrink the band back down. I think the band kept getting bigger and bigger till we got to like maybe the one night only Madison Square Garden where we had we had more background singers and that's kind of when Nigel got back involved again. And, um, but then Elton wanted to shrink the band back to its real core small band. And luckily they asked me to stay. So was that when you kind of knew like, okay, this is probably gonna be a more like, this is gonna be a long, whole gig potentially no. so no. You, didn't, you didn't feel any certainty then oh, i mean you're a musician right i mean it's like uh, you know you i never think that i'm that my gig is going to be there forever i i come from that school of you know i'm doing the best i can right here and right now and this gig could be gone tomorrow so yeah i mean one of my oldest friends uh from Ohio that I just tried to see. He's in his 80s now and I used to play with him when I was a teenager 
And, um, and he always used to tell me, he'd say, John, you got to play every gig like it's the last gig you're ever going to do, man. <laughs> well, it turns out to be truer than ever these days. Um, did you guys know in Australia, like, before you finished that leg of the tour, were you thinking, okay, well, there's a chance we might not be doing the next leg of the tour? Yes and no. I mean, more yes, because in Australia, the virus had already started to, you know, the wheels had already started moving and we started hearing a lot of things on the news before they were talking about it. I think in America, I'm not sure about uh, Great Britain, but in America, uh, they were definitely behind when Australia was talking about it. So this would have been December, January, right? When they, we started hearing about this thing coming out of China. And, and then one day it was right around the big, yeah, the end of the Australian tour, Elton called everybody in and said, you know, he said, I don't have a good feeling about this. I think, I think this is going to be it. You know, we're going to be shutting down for a while. He said, so we, we had an idea that it was going to stop. Definitely. Yeah. Not uh, for this long. Right. When you played the last gig, did you think, okay, this might be it for a little while? Uh, for a little while, yeah. Yeah, I thought this is going to be it for a little while. But I never, I, but I still, I thought, you know, a couple of months in yeah. the fall, you know, like now in the fall, we were supposed to be in Europe, right? Um, yeah. I thought we'd be starting up again. I didn't think it would get this, I didn't think it would be this intense worldwide no. like it is, yeah. Yeah, I think everybody did. I think it's easy to say now, oh, like, you know, how could anybody have expected to get back to normal? But I think at the time, most people were thinking this would be six weeks, two months, three months, maybe. Yeah. People definitely thought the full concerts were going to go ahead because loads of dates were postponed yeah. right at the end of the year. I mean, I, I do think that, I think even Elton himself thought, um, that it was gonna, you know, that by the end of the summer, we were gonna kind of have this thing was gonna sort of die out. And, uh, you know, a lot of people said that, that it was gonna die out by the end of the summertime. And when the fall came around, you know, we had to maybe worry about the flu or something. But, um, I, you know, the last information we got from, you know, Elton and Rocket Management and the company and stuff that um, it's looking like uh, 2022, you know, that we're going to start doing the American dates again. So um, best case scenario, I think um, best case scenario, maybe the end of next year, right? Like yeah. November, November, something like that. But man, who knows, right? Yeah. What a, a strange situation. How's it been adjusting from playing over 100 gigs a year for nearly <laughs> 20 years? And now not being on the road, has, has it been tough or has it been, you know, has parts of it been a nice rest? Parts of it have been a nice rest. Yeah, I, I have to say that. I mean, um, it's nice not being in a hotel and airplanes and airports and buses and vans and, you know, restaurants, strange places every day. That part of it's been nice to just be home. And, uh, you know, I've got to spend some time with some friends and, I'm not, I mean, I'm not completely sequestered myself. Like I have some friends up in Lake Tahoe. So I, you know, trying to get up there and, and get out of, um, you know, just kind of get out of LA actually is what I've been trying to do. I just spent six weeks in Ohio. I have a, I have a place in Ohio too. So um, I spent six weeks there and that was, it's much different there than it is in, in Los Angeles. It's much more um, uh, open right, if you will, there's more, like I did a couple of little outdoor gigs there with some friends where I just brought a little mini kit and, you know, played kind of half percussion, half drum thing and sang. And uh, and it was like outdoor, like a winery, if you will, like a patio kind of gig. And and that was great, but we don't really have those here in LA. Um, and back in Ohio too, people are, you know, they're inside of restaurants eating, they're distance, but they're still inside. And yeah. I don't think, I don't think, I don't know about London, but I, I know in LA, there's no, you can't go to any indoor restaurants. I don't believe. Really? Yeah. No, it's all, everything's out. They have to have an outdoor patio 
or it's takeout. There's no in, in in restaurant dining came back into London in June or something. Mm, no, maybe not, just start of July. No, very they're very strict here still. L.A. must be. I think California, a, a, one of the strictest places in in like the Western world when it comes to coronavirus. Yeah, I think so too. But you know, it's like I don't. I mean, we went to a place and we, you know, it's California. The weather's beautiful. You sit yeah. outside. So, you know, we're used to doing that. So it's not a big deal. And I don't mind it. You know, it's okay. Yeah. And I guess, I guess we've, we've all got to do, you know, what, what needs to be done. But, but in terms of, um, you know, the future of live music, like, do, do you really see it coming back end of next year? I mean, or is it just, you know, anyone's guess really at this point? And that goes for anyone in the industry. I mean, I see it coming back. I think, I think um, you, you pretty much have to watch the sports fields, right? I mean, you have to see what they're doing. And, and, and they're definitely putting their foot in the water. Um, they're trying to stay in their bubbles. You know, I, I'm not so hip to, like, what the world of soccer is doing because I don't really follow that, you know, so much. But American football and American baseball – and basketball, I can see that um, they've tested the ground and like American football has people in the stands, but at about normally where they would have, let's say 50,000 people, they have about 5,000 in the stands. So they've cut it down to a fifth or a 10th of their normal capacity, um, which is, you know, obviously terrible for uh, economics, but it's a start, you know, they're trying to do, I don't know about over there, but here they're trying to do some of these concerts where you, it's a, you stay in your car, like you do a drive-in theater type of a thing and, and you sit in your car and listen to the, and watch the band. Yeah. So, yeah. I've seen that. Uh, they trialed it a bit, but I don't know how much, I mean, here, even for people to go out in their cars, um, cause they'd be outdoors and it's, it's going to get really cold and stuff. You know, I can see that working more in California, but even then, you know, yeah, it'd have to be a very, very good concert to even consider doing that. Yeah, and and the problem with us is like with the farewell tour, right? It's a that's a big production with um, you know, sixty plus people on the on you know in the crew alone, you know, plus you know that's a lot of people to have together. And those people have to travel together and then you got to put them in hotels. And um, I think personally, I, I, if we're going to start this up, I'm almost thinking that maybe we're going to have to do a residency type of a thing where they can screen people that are coming into, like, let's say we go back and do, let's say Vegas. I'm just, I'm just spouting off here. I don't know. I mean, no one's even talking about this, but I'm just saying if you did something like that, you could control the way people come in and out of the venue, you could really have a much better control of how distance people are when they sit there. You could take people's temperature if you really wanted to go that far. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you, structure. you create your own little performance bubble and people can come in to see the show. But once again, like you said, it's going to have to be something that people are going to really want to put themselves through to go you know, uh, to be a little bit at risk, I guess. It's it's complicated, man. I don't I don't know how it's going to work. Um, yeah, I can see the Vegas, the, the logic behind something like Vegas. I mean, I think being in the band that you're in, you you you're definitely going to be uh, near the top of the list. Um, for, for you know, people will will come out. Uh, yeah, I, sure. I believe that. I believe that. I, I believe people will come. And I think when we start, you know, when this, let's say this thing breaks open, there's going to be bands touring like crazy, right? There's going to be live music everywhere. And, uh, um, and I can see uh, it's going to be some competition too, right? Because now everybody wants to go, everybody wants to play Madison Square Garden, right? If these places open up, there's going to be a fight to see who gets, you know, in line to play the big venues. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and so, so if and when the tour picks up, are you guys going to be picking up kind of what, like more or less what you were meant to be 
doing and it all gets shifted back for as long as it takes to finish the run. Yeah, from what I understand, yes. From what I understand, we are, you know, all those, um, all those, I, th I believe there was some shows that, there's probably shows that are like what we call makeup shows that we maybe had to cancel. And I have a feeling those are going to get pushed way to the end of the line. But as far as, as far as like the U S dates, they're just going to bump them a whole nother year in advance and keep yeah. them, keep them very similar to what they were. Um, and I'm sure that's going to be the same for the Europe. The European dates are more complicated because we were supposed to be in Europe now. So maybe what they'll do is they'll push those to, 20, late 2022, man, uh, you know, two years from now or something like that. And, and it was the plan to still go all around the world, you know, even like Asia and places like that. That is the plan. I mean, I don't know. We're not really getting a lot of information because I think they don't know, you know, it's um, because yeah. this is an AEG sponsored tour. And I, I think the plan is to cover the major markets that that we were um, that we were already that, that they've already sold tickets to, right? So which which is Europe, United Kingdom, and the United States. Those are those are already sold shows that we're you know they're going to try to fulfill those. Now those other shows they haven't put on the market yet. Uh, it's anybody's guess what will happen with those. Yeah be 2025 or something we'll still be touring who knows <laughs> yeah i mean this definitely uh i mean this is an extenuating uh circumstance so so we can't say that it was always going to be the never-ending farewell yellow brick road but uh you know there were some skeptics who are saying you know elton john's never going to retire the band will be on the road forever and now it certainly seems like to even fulfill the initial promise it's going to be a yeah. long time on the road um do, do you think that if you know if and when you guys get to the end of the tour you would end up doing something like it was mooted that you might do a residency or something like that I, I would i could see us doing a residency somewhere because it would be a lot less taxing on everyone physically you know elton he i mean he likes residencies if they don't he likes them when they don't go on and on and on and on, right? I mean, Vegas was the perfect residency because, you know, we did three weeks there. And after, you know, after three weeks, you're kind of like, okay, it's time to go play somewhere else. You know, it gets a little bit, for a band like us, it gets a little bit old. So um, I would say that a residency is a good possibility because a long time ago, they talked about residencies like... Um, uh, like I think the Beacon Theater in New York has a, a like Steely Dan does a residency there, and uh, the Allman Brothers used to always do something. So I, I think, and then there was even talk about some theater in London that might work for a residency. So um, I mean that'd be cool, right? We go there for a month, and then you know, and then you go somewhere else for a month. I think I think that'd be fantastic myself. Yeah, but, it'd be make touring a, a lot easier for you. So I mean yeah. having. Having been in Elton's band for, you know, over 20 years, right? How long has yeah. it been? 24 years, maybe? Since years. 90. Wow. Um, what, what are the Elton John tunes that you have not played yet that you kind of think, God, you know, these should be added to the set list? Oh man, I think I've played every possible song there is. I, I, I mean, I've always been looking forward to playing some stuff that we maybe touched on one time, like let's say my father's gun, right? Or uh, um, that's a big, and Amarina, you know, I like playing that one, but we don't, you know, I think some of those songs we tried to do one time and then Elton went, eh, you know, he's got to really be, if he's not feeling it 120%, then he's going to go, nah, nah, it's not going to work. Cause, cause he's, you know, he thinks way ahead of the rest of us. At least he thinks way ahead of me because he's always thinking about how is this song going to fit in the set? You know, and, and how's the audience going to react to it? And what song do you put before it? And what song do you put after it? But I mean, I love playing songs like Honky Cat. We hardly do that anymore. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, there's all those beautiful songs like 60 Years On and... Um, 
harmony, we've always tried to bug him to play to do harmony again, uh, which I think would be a great set opener, right? That'd be the first song in the set. Oh, yeah, yeah. Instead of coming out and just smacking everybody in the face, you know, you do that song where it's almost like it's down a little bit, right? And, uh, yeah. But, man, anything could happen. You know, the, the, the thing about the Farewell Tour is they built the stage and all these videos to go along with that set list, you know? Yeah. So a lot of that stuff, it's hard to change the, I mean, it's not, it can be done, right? But it's, but you can't just say, oh, let's do this song and then have a blank screen behind the band. When you have a screen like that, you have to use it. So uh, we just put, I can't think of it right now. We put a new song in there and did a new video for it, but we never got to, we never got to play it. Um, I can't remember. That's uh -huh. terrible. I can't remember what song it was. But, um, but that's, you know, if we did a residency, then that's some of those things where you could just throw out a tune every night and go, hey, let's throw this in there. Let's throw that in there. That's kind of what Steely Dan did. You know, they played a whole, they would play like a different album every night. Now that's not easy to do because you have to do a lot of rehearsal, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys, you guys rehearse mainly with uh, Adam Chester, right? Yeah, yeah. The guy Adam Chester, um, he comes in, and when we're in America and Elton is in London, we'll get Adam to play the piano so we can, you know, we can hear the song with the piano in it. Uh, so, so presumably, if you were to literally say, right, we're going to do all these deep cuts you know I, I sort of think i hear a lot of uh fans uh whenever i speak to to more kind of arden like elton john fans they are always sort of saying oh i wish it i wish they'd do this and i wish they'd do that and sort of you know kind of it's 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 great enough to have have the gigs as they are do you know what i mean like it would be good to, to hear some other stuff but there's a lot of work that goes into just bringing a single sh song into the show Particularly yeah. as you mentioned with the uh, with the video and all that side of it. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I feel for those, you know, those diehard fans. I, I feel for them because those songs are great, you know, and when you get to hear, when you get the chance to hear actually Elton actually play those songs. Yeah. It's, it's so wonderful. But the other part of it is there's a lot of people that come to our shows that, that are, um, they're fans, but they're not like the diehard fans that know his catalog back, you know, like the back of their hand. I mean, yeah. some, some of those fans amaze me because they, they know songs that I don't, that I've never even heard, you know, they'll pull a song off of, I don't know, don't shoot me on your pamphlet or something, you know, some flip side song that I don't, I mean, I know his songs, but I don't know his songs like, uh, you know, I don't know every album and every song and, I have to go back and refresh my memory now and then, but um, but the, what I was gonna, what I was getting at was there's people that come to these shows that pay a lot of money, and they want to hear those hits, man, because that's that's what they came to the that's show. Experience. They want the big Elton John experience. They want to hear the big, you know, the mat, you know, they want to hear the biggest songs from "Don't Let the Sun Go Down" to Daniel and Rocket Man and you know, Benny and the Jets and that, that bitch is back. They want to hear those songs. And if you start throwing these other songs in there, there's only so much time you can play on that stage um, before, you know, the, we tire out or the, you know, Elton, I don't think he would ever tire out. I think, I think if you would let him, he'd do a three and a half hour show. I think if you let him do it, but. Um, Who won't let him do it then? I mean, presumably it'd be too tiring for everybody. Sometimes the venues have curfews, number one, so you can only be on the stage for so long because, you know, they have to uh, not only get all those people in there at the end of the night, they have to get all those people safely out of there. So a lot of places have curfews or they have time limits. Um, his manager will tell him, you can't play a show that long, you'll, you'll kill yourself, you know, because if because he would do it every night till he would basically be exhausted. And, you know, and of course, you, you know, where's the band down? Because that's a long time to be on stage and playing that many songs. Um, but he's a, you know, he's a powerhouse, man. He, he would, he would totally, uh, you know, you got to drag him off stage, even when he's not well, 
you, you know, in Australia, he was sick as a dog on stage and we had to drag him off the stage practically because he was just really, I kind of think he might have even had COVID or something there because he was really sick for a while. Um, yeah, I kind of, I kind of think in hindsight, so I remember we, we, we were, you know, half thinking of, uh, of being in Australia to visit some friends there and, and you know, the fact that you you guys were playing some shows in Australia was only an added bonus because I've only been to one of the farewell tour, uh, tour shows in Italy. I hadn't been for a while, and uh, and I just had this feeling like God, we should have grabbed the chance and stuff. And then when the walk, there was the whole pneumonia thing. It's interesting that you say that about coronavirus because uh, it does seem you know the symptoms are very similar, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a lot of friends, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of friends here in America that told me they were very, very ill in the beginning of the year, more sicker than they've ever been um, before they even heard about the coronavirus. So, but then of course, you know, you get tested and it says you don't have the antibodies or whatever. I, I don't really know, but I know a lot of people that were very ill the beginning of the year. And, and when I saw Elton out there on stage and we're all like going, dude, just get off the stage, man, just go. We can, you know, we'll make this show up. But he kept banging away until he just couldn't sing anymore. His voice stopped basically. And then he just kind of apologized to the audience and left. Um, I think that, that might've been in New Zealand, maybe if I remember rightly, but, uh, but yeah, he would have, he would have played until he passed out, you know, because he knows those people, they pay a lot of money to go there they go through a lot of hassle to get into those kind of venues, those big venues. You know, you know, man, you've been to those concerts and, you know, it can be a lot of work for some people to go to one of our shows. And, and he wants to give them every possible penny's worth because that's just what he is. He's the, he's the consummate performer. So, yeah, I think, I think one of the reasons why people, find themselves returning to uh, your guys' concerts is the fact that it's all 100% live, um, which, you know, my listeners who aren't familiar with, you know, the back end of uh, pop and rock music shows. Um, and in fact, I want to ask you, you know, is how rare is that to be 100% live, like in the upper echelons of the music industry? Yeah. Well, I can only speak from, you know, from knowledge that I, that I know other friends of mine that are in other bands, right? That, um, but I will say a lot of the bands that I know, there's somebody running a computer, you know, he's turning that computer on and there's, there's some kind of a backing track with most bands that I know that's even bands you would think, no, nah, they, they would never run a backing track because they're all such great musicians but sometimes they do it just to make the sound fatter and so i'm going to say that in those big pop bands probably 90 percent of them are playing to some kind of you know maybe it's not a lot of track maybe it's just um maybe some odd keyboard part or some maybe some kind of weird percussion loop that they like or maybe something to enhance the background vocals but uh, but our band, man, it's pretty rare to see somebody just play where everything you hear on that stage is coming out of what we're doing up there. There's no there's no computer running anything. You know, Nigel, he, he's like, I'm not going to play because when that happens, the drummer has to play to a click track, right? The drummer's got to play to some kind of a, a track so he stays in time with the tape. And Nigel's, yeah. yeah. I mean, thank God for Nigel, because he's just like, I'm not doing it, you know, so don't he like click tracks, does he? he no. <laughs> and, and why, so why does, why does Elton, uh, and why do the band kind of not, you know, why do you guys not want to, because wouldn't it be the easier way out, you know, because it is, it's a big advantage to let a computer make your sound fatter and technology is getting more impressive all the time. So by, by doing it live, you guys are putting yourselves under, under more pressure. Um, yeah. I, I think that's why the fans love it. But where does this desire to put yourselves under that pressure come from? Because you guys could be afforded all the luxuries that you want. I don't think we look at it like that. I think we, we are, 
we're all players, you know, we're all musicians, musicians, right? So we're not like technologically, uh, I mean, we, we could be, but we come from the, the we come from the old school play style of you we're in a, we're very fortunate to be able to play in a band like that. And to, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of like an artist in a way, you know, why, you know, he, you don't really have to, um, you know, paint that, you know, beautiful portrait or something like that. You don't necessarily have to do it when you could just get maybe a machine to make it for you and plunk it up on the wall like that. Right. Uh, yeah. We all come from just playing backgrounds where we all studied our instruments and, and you know, and there's a way of, uh, uh, you know, the, the dynamics and the, the interaction with the other players, you know, you're not going to get that when you put a tape on, you're going to get the same homogenized, you know, just middle of the road thing and nobody and that's Elton's big thing is people come to hear a band they come to hear us play music they don't come to hear a tape because if they wanted to hear a tape they'd just sit in the car and put their you know or stay at home and put a record on they they want to yeah. see mu musicians play music that's what's called performing and he and I understand when he gets really pissy with other artists when he finds out that they're you know that they're not playing to a that they're playing to some kind of a background tape to help them sound better. Um, I mean, I'm the same way. I don't, when I, I don't want to go really hear, a, I can tell and a lot of times I can hear it, right? Okay, I can tell that that's, nobody's, play, I can see that nobody's playing some part, right? And I go, okay, that's gotta be on tape. Um, and it drives me, it doesn't, I don't get, crazy mad about it it's like it is what it is because that's technology now it's like you said it is it is easy for you to do it and it is a good tool to have but we don't believe that you should do it if you don't have to do it if if, if you can play the instrument and create that sound by playing then that's what the audience wants to see they don't want to see a guy go like this start <laughs> No, I mean, I personally don't, but a lot of people seem to be, uh, you know, satisfied with that level of uh, non-existent musicianship. Um, I have a feeling most people don't really pay that much attention to it. I think most people see the artist up there moving around and dancing or whatever, and, and 